The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus said to his apostles, Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Whoever receives you receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. Whoever receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever receives a righteous man because he is a righteous man will receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever gives only a cup of cold water to one of these little ones to drink because the little one is a disciple, amen, I say to you, he will surely not lose his reward. The Gospel of the Lord. In the Gospel today, our Lord Jesus teaches us about discipleship and about taking up our cross and following him so that we be worthy of him. In an age of instant gratification and satisfaction, the cross does not sound all that appealing. For what does the cross entail but love's suffering, about self-sacrifice, no longer clinging to the self, about losing oneself and denying oneself for the sake of Christ, giving oneself as a gift for others. A seldom discussed cross for an increasing number of people today in our culture and around the world is infertility. We hear of it in the first reading, this woman who lives in Shunem, the Shunemite woman, is infertile. She has no children. Her husband is getting on in years. And Alicia, who is the, benefact, the one who benefits from her hospitality, gives them a little room up on the roof with a bed and a desk and a lamp, wants to offer her something in return for that gift. And so he prophesies that by next year's time, she will have a son. The verse that follows what we have in the reading today is that she remonstrates him. Don't deceive me, prophet. She doesn't want to get her hopes up and be disappointed, but she does conceive and bear a son. And scripture, as we know, has significant women in it who were infertile for long periods of time, but then conceived through God's power, through some angelic presence. Sarah has Isaac, Samson's mother, unnamed Manoah's wife. Hannah has Samuel, and in the New Testament, Elizabeth, as John the Baptist, thought to be barren in her old age. In our present day, there are many couples, and many women in particular, who suffer from infertility. Research estimates that one out of every six couples will experience infertility in the course of their marriage. It can be a great burden for women. They can feel abandoned and isolated, even by the church. They can feel inferior to others. They see other women around them having babies. It can be difficult for them to go to masses at their parish where there are abundant children. They can feel judged by others, grandparents wondering where the grandchildren are. And the repeated failure to achieve pregnancy can put a strain on the marriage. Husband and wife feeling like they're using one another to achieve pregnancy. That great, wonderful day for most, Mother's Day, becomes a day of burden as women are reminded that they don't have children. There can be a sense of this call to be married and to have children, but the children do not arrive. It gives a sense of, right, it can be a burden, a suffering, a cross. 
But is there a way to heal infertility? At the end of this month, July 25th, we will mark the anniversary of Louisa Brown. Her parents, Leslie and John, were nine years trying to have children, but were unable to. She had blocked fallopian tubes. And so they went to the clinic, to a new artificial reproductive clinic, and Louisa Brown was conceived in a Petri dish and then implanted in her mother's womb, and she was born July 25, 1978. She's now 39 years old, married, and has children of her own through natural means. That couple then had a second child through in vitro fertilization, Natalie, who came along four years later. Louisa and Natalie are made in the image and likeness of God. They are beautiful gifts. But what's the relationship of artificial reproductive technologies, in vitro fertilization and others, to human dignity, to the integrity of marriage, to the dignity of being husband and wife, the church teaches that the origin of life has its authentic context in marriage and the family that is generated by an act which expresses the mutual love of a man and a woman for one another in marriage. And that this intensely personal act that's also potentially generative, that can bring forth new life, can have no substitute. That when a husband and wife come together in this personal gift of oneself to the other, that's going to overflow potentially into the gift of new life, right? it's part of that personal gift. And technology cannot substitute for that, whether it's through pipettes, petri dishes, physicians, donors, vendors of different gametes or embryos. So the church teaches that we can't unravel, we should not unravel the procreative dimension to that personal act, that marital act, and the unitive dimension. There's also, beyond that principle of anthropology, there's a shadow side to reproductive technology. Louisa Brown and Natalie are wonderful gifts made in God's image and likeness. Every human being has that dignity. But the means by which a human being comes about can be unrighteous. So part of the shadow side of IVF is that many children have to die for one child to live. On average, there are six embryos that are conceived for every one child that is going to be born. And what happens to those other five? Many are in cryopreservation, 400,000 humans in embryonic form throughout the United States. But many others are aborted because they're the wrong gender, the wrong genetics. There's too many in the womb, so they selectively reduce. There's a lot of doublets, twins, and triplets in IVF. Leslie and John had lots of other children besides Louisa, but they are no longer here. There's a dark shadow side and in some ways, it's the reverse of the cross that says others must die that my child must live or that I can live. But the essence of the cross is that I give my life so that others can live. So is there any recourse then to people who suffer from infertility? Now, the church is not against technology. It's for the moral use of technology. And there are moral types of technology Natural procreative technology, abbreviated NAPRO technology, they can help facilitate and bring about conception and birth. But it respects the dignity of a child as a gift, the integrity of marriage, and the dignity of, of husband and wife as man and woman. And it also addresses and treats the underlying causes of the infertility, which IVF bypasses. You don't cure the disease or the cause of the infertility. So just one example, in 1970, well, there's a 29-year-old 20, woman. For seven years, she had been unable to achieve pregnancy. She had gone through ovulation induction, artificial insemination, all unsuccessful. And so she goes to a NAPRO physician. And they start to track her cycle. And they can diagnose the problem. So they give her a vitamin B6 protocol 
and she starts to observe bodily fluids that she's never observed in her body before. And her husband and wife, in that first cycle, achieve a pregnancy. In some ways, if we look at the church's teaching on natural procreative technology, natural family planning, it's prophetic in a world, our world. And one might say that this achievement of pregnancy was a prophet's reward. Seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, says Jesus. Now, NAPRO technology can't heal every infertility, every situation, but it's much more effective than any artificial reproductive technology. Without any of the shadow sides, there are no selective abortions. There are no frozen embryos. IVF at its best is around 26% effective success rate. NAPRO technology, depending on the type of condition that the woman has, is anywhere effective from 38% to 82%. It can be three times as effective as the artificial forms. Diseases are identified, diseases are treated. More total pregnancies are achieved. It's built on the foundation of, of life and not destroying life. It's more cost effective. Everything about it points to flourishing. But there's not healing for everyone. And so there's still this suffering, there's still the cross of infertility. How do women who suffer from infertility, couples who suffer from it, enter into the cross of Jesus Christ and find and give life conform to him who gave his life for us that we might live and flourish? There are other ways to serve life and to serve the human person. Adoption is an option for some, but not all how to give assistance to other families, to the poor, to children who are disabled, to be involved in the community. Jesus Christ comes to heal. It's not always going to be a physical healing, but he can heal our spirits. And I think about the Beatitudes and how can all of us, right, we're all called to live the life of the Beatitudes. It's what's the reading in All Saints Day. It's what makes us saints to live this life of Christ. Christ is the Beatitudes. He lived them himself. He is them. And for those who can't have children who desire it so much, blessed are those who mourn. They shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the merciful. Jesus has come not to make life easy, not to satisfy every longing and desire, but to direct us to him, to satisfy that deepest longing in our hearts. Pick up your cross and follow me. Enter into my life. And it's what we do in every Eucharist. We receive the body of Christ that we might better be the body of Christ. How can we be aware of those who suffer in our midst, to be compassionate and not be judging, to be merciful to those, not to, to have a hasty judgment about why someone might not have children? And for those who do suffer from infertility, to enter into the life of the Beatitudes, the life of Christ. And like every disciple, to pick up our cross and follow him, that we might indeed be worthy of him.